Welcome back once again to Inside South Florida. Looking for a new cool activity to do down here? Maybe have a great date but don't know where to take that person? Well, here is Brian Bordanik, the CEO of Dinner Lab, with a great new endeavor that they're putting together. Brian, it's great to have you on the show, man. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. You're making me feel overdressed right now. <laughs> we, uh, we like to bring a very casual concept forward, so to show up in a suit would feel a little disingenuous. It's not who you are. Yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. Right. Um, Dinner Lab's great, and I can say that because I've been to it, you know, um, and I loved my experience there. But for people who don't know, tell us what it's all about. The whole idea behind Dinner Lab is to bring people in contact with really elevated concepts and new concepts in food in a very unpretentious way. And right now, the way that we do that is we give the number twos, threes, and fours at major restaurants like OTC, Azul, a platform to put their culinary vision out in the public and uh, get feedback to get better at what they do. Yeah, and um, you know, you and I are talking about this before, so they may cook the same thing every day all the time at their restaurant, but now they've got a chance in another cool venue to kind of riff a little bit, right? That's exactly right. What we see with chefs all the time is that they're cooking sort of the same food that's sort of dictated to them in the restaurant, and then they go home or on their time off or when they're cooking for staff, they cook these amazing concepts that never see the light of day. So selfishly, when we were starting the concept, we said, that's the meal that we want, where there's sort of the passion meets the, the technical skill. And that's why we created our business to do. Did you create it um, just so you could get a whole bunch of really good meals around the country, <laughs> just like eat for free? Was well, that more, more or less, the idea when we first started was the concept originated in New Orleans. And New Orleans is a place where you can drink at a bar until 7 o'clock in the morning, but you can't get a table service at a restaurant past about 9.30. So we started to wanted to have a platform to bring people together late night, which turned out to be a terrible idea. I imagine bringing people together at 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning in New Orleans. You can imagine sure. the, yeah, <laughs> the sure. difficulty in doing right. that. Um, but what happened was we were interacting with so many different chefs that were saying, hey, instead of putting forward just a random menu, um, I just started dating someone that is really into like healthy living, and I've been spending a lot of time at farmer's markets, so I've been playing around with this. Can I put that forward? Or I'm from Korea. I would love to cook Korean food, like real authentic Korean food for people. So we pivoted into the normal dining hours and then started putting forward these meals and people were sort of blown away because you have an opportunity to sort of eat someone's story. That sounds really weird, but it's sort of what you what happens. It's yeah. I mean, I, you and I were saying earlier, it's, I think it's analogous to a, a lead singer of a band going off and doing a solo project, you know? Absolutely. When you look at a restaurant, you have a head chef who you know, is usually working the floor and sort of running the, the budgets to actuals. And then you have these sous chefs, these chefs de partie, these line cooks who are coming up with a new concept, who are actually executing on a daily basis. But those jobs are so few and far in between. And the risk from a financial standpoint of opening a new restaurant is so high that promotion within the industry is very, 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 very low. Most back of house staff wind up working at a restaurant for about a year to a year and a half tops. And then they make lateral moves. It's a really weird industry in the sense that you can be 27, 28 years old and be at the peak of your career and have nowhere to go. Yeah. So we sort of uh, are seeing that and sort of tapping into that frustration and giving these guys and girls a really creative platform to get a new idea out into the open. They must jump at it. It's been, uh, it's been an amazing kind of reception. When you first start any company, right, you have to sort of beat the pavement and, and get the word out. But we treat our staff amazing. Um, and after that, they refer people from all over the place. And it's been really cool for us uh, as a company, now that we're in 10 cities across the U.S., to be able to take chefs from Miami and sort of export them up to New York. And you sort of see this uh, diffusion of ideas, which is really interesting. And it's, uh, it's been really cool to be a part of. The one I went to in Miami, uh, what I thought was interesting, well, the food was great, first of all. Um, but, you know, they give you, like, comment cards. And they want your honest opinion of what works, what doesn't work. Would you see this in a, could you see this being a, a meal in a restaurant, things like that. So it's, it's interactive from a, a consumer as well. Yeah, and we did that for the benefit of the chef. So these chefs are sort of putting forward meals that sometimes they haven't prepared for 100 people before. So what we try to do is, is use that comment card to give a chef as granular data as possible about what's working and what doesn't work. And what's kind of fun about being in a bunch of different cities is that if we take a chef from here in Miami and then put them over into Austin, then go to New Orleans, you can actually look at sort of uh, differences in the data that you're actually collecting. So a chef can actually adapt and change a menu. So you're looking at sort of micro data from within the Miami market and saying, this is how people are responding to different things here. Mm -hmm. And then you can look at that over the macro sort of across the rest of the country and see so how are different trends sort of emerging amongst different age groups, different sexes, things like that, so that a chef is sort of armed with that data. Look, Opening restaurants is always going to be a risky proposition. Right. It's just when people tell us that, you know, for people who are in the industry, oh, one in three restaurants is going to fail within the six months, it's the most insane thing we've ever heard. So we're trying to provide as much data as humanly possible so that people can wrap their arms around 
uh, and, and mitigate the risk of uh, restaurant openings. Are you finding, you know, consumers in Miami have different, you know, taste palettes than New York or New Orleans, and, and how different is it? You're starting to see, I mean, especially down here in Miami, there's a, there's a huge difference. Um, you see granular differences in terms of uh, what's working here versus in other places, but a lot more fresher ingredients. And there's, when you really drill down into it with different cooking styles and techniques, how that juxtaposed to a market, say, like Austin, Texas, which is a little bit more heavy into barbecue, uh, really heavy sauce kind of uh, appetite. So yeah. it's really interesting to look at that data, but we actually provide that to the chef. So when a chef comes into a market that's not from here, they can look and see, oh, how did the last five times that someone sous vide something, how did that go? And they can look and make really informed decisions about what's working and what's not. The, when you look at feedback in the restaurant industry, you know, when was the last time you filled out uh, a comment card that comes in a check? Yeah, I mean, yeah, your thing, that was it. <laughs> about 97% of our people fill out the comment card in its entirety because it's sort of the central core thesis of who we are right. as a company. And that information it is just extremely powerful, but in the industry, what typically happens when you're at a restaurant, if you know the owner or you know the chef, the owner and the chef come out and they say, how was everything? Right. You go, <clears throat> it was great. Right, absolutely right. And then yep. they leave and then you're like, wow, that appetizer really sucks. It's so <laughs> No, it's so true. And yeah. that, that literally just happened to me like a week ago. You don't want to say, oh yeah, your food's terrible and yeah. there's a hair in it. Yeah. That's a lot for yeah. that. Yeah. And that's why we try to really make that information as available as possible. And it's not in a way that's attacking the food, but look, no course is perfect, no idea is perfect, but the idea of iterating and, and developing an idea in the restaurant industry sort of doesn't exist. You sort of plant your flag and say, this is my menu, yeah. and it's gonna be sure. like this for a while. So we kind of think that in this industry, consumer behavior is so dynamic, and it's very challenging to keep up with. We're as clueless as anybody else, but at least we can react a little bit faster. What is this uh, chef's tour, nine chefs, 10 cities, and somebody gets a restaurant at the end of it? <laughs> so with that data, we actually think that we can make more of an informed decision about who opens what restaurant where. So we're taking uh, our, our nine chefs, our, our nine best chefs that we found from across the country so far, and we're rotating them around the country. So each one of them will do a meal in each one of our cities, and then we'll use the data to open what we're calling sort of uh, the first database restaurant in the world. So the idea is say, listen to what consumers want, and put a restaurant with a chef there in that city, and then go from there. Yeah. If people want to go to, do you have any events coming up down here that people can go to? Yeah, we're doing at least an event a week here um, in Miami, so people can go on the website, uh, dinnerlab.com, and the way that the business is run, it's a membership-based uh, organization, so you pay an upfront subscription fee, uh, and then we try to keep our events between you know 55 and $70, all in tax gratuity alcohol, so it's a, yeah. it's a, pretty, it's a pretty solid deal. And, and fun locations, too. Yeah, we're always looking for sort of innovative spots that are not the traditional restaurant. So we have a mobile kitchen that we'll bring on site. And then we, what we love about it is there's so many spots in the city that you probably have driven by a hundred times but have never kind of gone behind. Um, so for us, our front of the house managers here love sort of, uh, you know, going into little nooks and crannies of a city and then being able to bring these other places to life. So we look for spaces that are sort of aspirational in nature, just like our chefs. They're sort of spaces that are not quite what they can be, but they're yeah. sort of on the uptick. I love it. Uh, website, one more time? Uh, it's dinnerlab.com. Easy enough. Brian, great to have you here, man. Uh, next time, let me know what the wardrobe is. And I'll, <laughs> we can uh, I'll dress yeah. accordingly. We can, we, can, we can match. We can match for It's sure. such a cool venture, man. Good luck with it. Thank you. I appreciate it. You got it. Thank you, Brian, and that'll wrap it up for our show today. If you have any ideas as to what we can cover, just tweet us at WSFL. You can also follow us on Facebook at SFLCW. And, of course, you can catch us every weekday morning from 6 to 8 a.m. for our morning show eye-opener. So that's it for now. We'll see you later on. Have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your weekend.